One. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Gary Friedman and welcome to the Friedman Archives blog. Today I want to talk to you about the workhorse of mechanical film cameras, the Minolta SRT series. They're wonderful. They don't require batteries unless you need an exposure meter. They still work and they make this wonderful kerchunk sound every time you take a picture, like that. How are they used? Many of you are taking beginning photography classes and are starting with film because there's a resurgence of interest in film. So what I, would, I thought I would do is take some time and go over the basic operation of these cameras so you can become proficient in a very short amount of time. Unlike modern digital cameras, there's only three variables to the exposure for the film cameras, f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. What are they? Well, let's go over those briefly. Let's start with the f-stop. To show you how the f-stop works, let me just take the lens off. You push this little thingy down and you rotate the lens counterclockwise. And of course, to put the lens back on again, you line up the red dots and turn until it clicks. But to take it off, you do that. And inside, you'll find a mirror, which is for feeding the optical viewfinder. And we'll go over some other details in a minute. This is how your f-stop works. You can make it very small or very large. When the f-stop opening is very small, it lets in less light. But it also increases what's in focus, in front of what you focused on and behind what you focused on. That's one variable. The second variable is your shutter speed. The shutter is that black piece of cloth that prevents light from coming in and hitting the film when you're not taking a picture. And you can control how much light comes in by keeping the shutter open a long period of time or a short period of time. Let me use the dial up on top here. Let me show you here. Let me use the dial up on top to select my shutter speed. I'll start at a half a second. Here we go. Now, if you were a piece of film, you would say, whoa, that's way too much light. But as you can see, it lets in light for that amount of time. So now if I change my shutter speed to something faster, for example, a 15th of a second. And here we go. Much faster. Now these old mechanical workhorses can do amazing things. Even though it's completely mechanical, you can do a shutter speed as fast as a thousandth of a second. Ooh. All right, here's what a thousandth of a second looks like. If you blink, you miss it. Now you might say, well, that's hardly any light at all. But on a bright day, high ISO film, that's quite a bit of light. So how do you know what shutter speed to choose? Well, if you're shooting action, a fast shutter speed will freeze the action. If you're using a slow shutter speed, it'll make things that move relative to the camera look blurry. Now, every time you take a picture, not only does the shutter open, but also the mirror up in front flips up and down like that. Why is the mirror necessary? Because when the lens is on the front, the light comes in from the lens and then hits the mirror, which is at a 45 degree angle, and then sends the information up to your optical viewfinder. And that is why you can see exactly what the lens sees before you take the picture. And then when you do take the picture, the mirror moves out of the way, the shutter opens, the f-stop closes down, I'll show you that in a second, and then your exposure is made. Now there's another shutter speed here called B. What does that do? B actually stands for bulb, and that's named that way for historic reasons. But when you have it in bulb mode, the shutter will stay open for as long as you keep your finger on the button. Thusly, the mirror is up, the shutter has opened, and now there's absolutely nothing between your lens and the film. It'll stay that way forever until, of course, you take your finger off. And that's what B does. So let's actually load a roll of film into this camera. I have something here from my last archaeological dig. This is a box of Kodak. Now Kodak used to be a big company that made film. This is an unopened box of Kodak Max. It's color film ISO 400. The higher the number, the more sensitive the film is to light. And the expiration date for this box is right over there. 2007. Ah, 
good vintage. So I'm going to open up this box. And inside is a, a light proof and waterproof canister. And inside that is film with a little bit of the film sticking out. Now, if you were to pull this out completely right now, you would expose it all and, and the film would be useless. The reason you have this is so you can load it into the camera. Now, the way you open up the camera back is to pull up on the rewind knob, pull up and up and up, and just when you think you can't pull up anymore, you pull up a little bit more, and then it releases the spring mechanism here, and then you open it up. Here's your shutter, which should be closed. Here's your take-up reel. Here's where the film canister goes. And when you close, when you push down on the rewind lever again, you can see this goes back into the film reel, and that kind of helps secure it in place. For the time being, let's pull that back up again. Here's your roll of film. The part that sticks up here, that goes down like this. If you can't push it down, if you can't push it in, sometimes you have to pull up on the rewind knob. There we go. It'll drop right in. Then you turn the rewind knob until it goes down all the way. Great. Now you pull the film across and then you see the slots in the take up reel right there. There's several of them. All you need is one. You put the tip of the film ton into one of those slots. And let me see if I can do this without obscuring with my fingers what, I, what it is I'm trying to show you. Doesn't have to be in far, just enough. Then you take a couple of pictures. There's one, as you can tell, I'm still on an eighth of a second. That's good, right there. Now, you close it, because obviously this film has been exposed to light, so it's not good. Close it, and then take two more pictures. One, two. Now, blank, unexposed film is right in front of the shutter, and we're gonna go from there. This film has an ISO rating of 400, and you have to tell that to the exposure meter so it knows how sensitive the film is to light. The way you change it, is on the shutter speed dial, you can see a little tiny window with a number in it. Right now it's set to 200. That's your ISO. That's how you tell the camera what kind of film you have. In order to change that number, you have to pull up on the ring around it and then rotate until the correct number is visible to the window. So I just changed it from 200 to 400. Great, now the camera will work. Now, before I can show you how the exposure meter works and how you know what settings to use for any given image, let me talk a minute about batteries because the original battery was called like a PX something or other. I forget what, they're not made anymore. Uh, the reason they're not made anymore is because they were filled with mercury and uh, kids would swallow these batteries and, and die. So they were taken off the market and they were replaced with something not quite the same thing. Uh, some batteries are a little bit smaller, some have different voltages. The original mercury battery was 1.3 volts and some of the substitutes are like 1.5 volts. Uh, and because there's no voltage regulator inside these things, if your battery voltage is off, your exposure recommendation is going to be off. Uh, there's a couple of different solutions to this. One is to put in a one and a half volt battery of a similar size and just compensate for it. Uh, overexposed by about a half a stop, and, and, and that should do it. The solution I have here is a little tiny exo battery. So the outside shape is the same shape and dimensions as the discontinued battery and on the inside is a little tiny voltage regulator. So if you put a battery that's one and a half volts inside here and put it inside the camera, the camera sees 1.3 volts. So this is as good as a native battery. The battery and the adapter together cost about $40 and you only have to buy the adapter once. So here's how I actually put it in. On the bottom of the camera, You've got the battery compartment. Open that up. And you've got a piece of metal just kind of sticking up. It requires pressure. Then you take the new battery sandwich and the side you can see there, that goes down. And then you put the case on top, thusly. 
Well, one thing I should mention here, the on off switch for this camera is over here. Guinness Book of World Records, worst place to put an on off switch. But you move it to the on position. Ah, I'm pushing pressure on your finger and there it's on. The other setting there, battery check, the needle deflects down. If it goes down all the way, then you know your battery's good. So the best way for me to sh explain this to you is by pointing it to just a completely white screen. And there's a couple things I want you to see right away. First of all, along the bottom, you can see the shutter speed that's been selected. If I turn my shutter speed dial on the top of the camera, you can see the shutter speed is correctly indicated on below. Notice also there's a stick of what they call a lollipop needle on the right that's moving up and down. If you change your f-stop, which is the ring around your lens, that lollipop stick moves also. Now this is you changing your f-stop. Some Minolta models, the higher end ones, will allow you to see the f-stop that you've chosen at the very, very top. And the way they do that is by a, a complex optical path, which I won't talk about now, but uh, it's a nice feature to have. So all of your exposure information is right there. Now let me turn on the meter. And as I do so, you can see another needle come out to the right. That one's a straight needle. That is your exposure guidance. You are free to ignore it, but if you align the lollipop needle to the exposure needle, then your exposure will be correct. And I use the word correct in air quotes. So as I mentioned, there's two ways to move that lollipop needle. One is by changing the f-stop, and the other one is changing the shutter speed. Any combination of them can yield a proper exposure. Okay, so let's say you've been going out shooting a little bit. Notice that every time you take the picture, and wind the film, you know that things are winding well when that starts to turn as well. Now there's an advanced feature that some of the higher end Minolta SRT series had, and it looks like this. It's a safe film load signal. If your film is loading and going correctly, then you'll see a little orange flag in that window start to progress from the left to the right. It's not a feature you need because you can see when this is turning, you know it's okay. So, let's say you're done taking pictures, and now you have to rewind your roll. The way you do it is you turn the camera over once again, and over here, this button here, disengages your sprocket. Press the button once, and then it stays in. Then you take this, that's the rewind knob, there's a built-in little knob right there, isn't that cute? And there's a little arrow right there, it tells you which direction to wind the film. You are winding the film all the way into that cassette. And when you feel the tension start to go away, you know you've, you've done a good job. And once again, pull up on this all the way. It pops open and there is your roll of film all set to go. Impossible to remove because this isn't up all the way. So let's fix that. Now in my day, you either took it to your dark room and developed it yourself, or you took it down to the drugstore, and they would bring it back in about two weeks. Let me show you a couple of additional features that are on some of the Minolta cameras. You're probably wondering what they do. First of all, this square thing on the back, that is for holding this. So you can be reminded about what film you have on the camera. Because if you switch a lot, you can easily forget. On some of the cameras, you have this here. This is called a PC sync cord. It's used when you had a clash on top of the camera. Modern cameras have the connector right in the hot shoe. So you mount the flash and the camera body and the flash communicate. It tells the flash exactly when to fire. Back in the olden days, that wasn't there and you had to connect the flash and the camera body by a wire. That's where you did it. Now, some of the Minolta's, like this one here, they have a little switch right next to that PC sync connector. And the switch is labeled. It says either X or FP. I'm going to date myself by explaining what this is. Before they had electronic flash, they had flash bulbs with little tiny, some kind of combustible metal on the inside. You had to fire the flash bulbs a fraction of a second before you took the picture. By that time, the flash bulbs were at maximum brightness and then you took the picture. With electronic flash, there's no such thing. So what the FP setting did 
is it would fire the flash bulb a fraction of a second before the shutter would open. When you set it to X for, I don't know what the X stands for, electronic xenon flash, I don't know what it is. Use the X for modern flash and the contact here or the contact here will go off at the right time. Now there's two other features worth mentioning. This one here is a self timer. You push the arm down and it reveals a button. And when you press the button, you got 10 seconds to run into your shot. A little mechanical arm goes up and 10 seconds later, more or less, and there you go. Now there's something else called depth of field preview. And before I can explain it, let me show you what the camera normally does whenever it takes a picture. There you are looking at the lens right now. If I take the picture, watch, look inside the lens and look at the f-stop blades. Do you see that? I'm going to do it again, except this time let's do one second. Here we go. The f-stop closes down only during the moment of exposure, and then it opens back up again. So if I do it like really fast, like a 15th of a second, here we go. That's what's going on. Why doesn't it just stay closed all the time? The answer is because you get the light from your optical viewfinder from the lens. If the lens is stopped down, it lets in very little light and your optical viewfinder goes dark. So the goal to have a really bright viewfinder is to keep the lens open all the time. But sometimes, let's say you're shooting an F8, you want to know before you shoot what's going to be in focus. Because we know that the smaller your f-stop is, the more things in front of what you focused on and behind what you focused on are going to become sharp. What's it going to look like? Well, the answer is you press this button and hold it. And when you do that, it will stay closed for as long as you hold your finger on the button. The viewfinder gets darker because it's letting in less light, but if you look beyond that, you can start to look at things that are far away, suddenly look a little bit sharper. Okay, so I'm going to show you the depth of field mechanism as it's seen through the eyepiece of the camera. First, you're going to focus on the front element, the camera. Now look at the background, it's a little fuzzy. Now I'm going to shoot at f8. What's that going to look like on film once I actually shoot? I press the depth of field preview button, and you can see it gets darker because it lets in less light, but if you look very carefully at the background, you can see it's a little bit sharper than it was wide open. Let me open up the f-stop a little bit to like maybe 5.6 and try it again. So there's the fuzzy background, and there's a slightly sharper background right there. Now I should mention that some of the Minolta's have a momentary depth of field preview button or one that's toggle. You push it in once and it stops down. You push it in again and it opens up again. Your mileage may vary. So that's the basic introduction to the Minolta SRT 100, 101, 102, 200, 201, and 202 cameras. There are other permutations, but uh, those are the major ones. Now you may be wondering, gee, with such primitive equipment, how is it possible to get really wow type images, the kind that National Geographic photographers used to get back in the day? The answer is their secrets can be known. For the last 25 years, I've been going around the world teaching the Friedman Archive Seminars, which teaches photographers of all levels, beginning to expert. Here are the secrets. You don't need a fancy camera to be able to get wow high impact images. Of course, there's a link right there. It's a streaming seminar, which means you'll be able to enjoy it in the comfort of your home and understand the secrets to getting wow images no matter what kind of camera you have, especially these babies. Good luck with your photographic journey and enjoy exploring your world.